Please join me in welcoming Joy Sisiski of the San Francisco-based Jewish Community Federation Endowment Fund and California Lieutenant Governor, Eleni Kudalakis. Good morning. It's nice to see everyone. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being here. I'm delighted to get to introduce you and help the audience get to know you a little bit today. Bye. Thank you so much. Be here and with everyone at JPEG. Welcome to Sacramento. So I'm going to first start by introducing you to everybody. Ambassador Eleni Kunalakis is the 50th Lieutenant Governor of the state of California and you're the first woman to be elected to this position. She is currently serving her second term. From 2010 to 2013, she served as a U.S. Ambassador to the Republic of Hungary and in 2015 published her acclaimed memoir, Madam Ambassador, Three Years of Diplomacy, Dinner Parties, and Democracy in Budapest. They love the name of that book. I feel like it might have inspired that Netflix show with a very restful. <laughs> Prior to her service, the Lieutenant Governor spent 18 years as an executive at one of California's most respected housing development firms, AKT Development. And throughout her career, she has served on numerous boards and commissions, including California's first five commission, the San Francisco War Memorial, San Francisco Port Commission, and the Association of American Ambassadors. She graduated from Dartmouth College, earned her MBA from UC Berkeley's Haas School of Business, and holds an honorary doctorate of law from the American College of Greece, and she is married with two children. So thank you for being here. It also is a going out saying that you are a good friend to the Jewish community and to Israel. I actually had the chance to hear you speak a couple of nights ago at the Yom HaAtzlobud event with the Israeli consulate, and you mentioned a little something about the many times that you've been to Israel. Um, and actually, if you don't mind, this is unscripted, but you told us something very interesting about a family member who lives in Israel. Well, Joy, it's wonderful to be with you and to be with everyone here. Uh, Eleni Kumalak is Lieutenant Governor, and um, I think you're referring to the fact that my aunt, uh, my Aunt Maria, for 30 years, was a Greek Orthodox nun in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in the Old City. So I visited many times, uh, both just as her niece, but also my capacity as a trustee of the World Council of Religions for Babies. But if I turn back the clock and go back in time, this same Aunt Maria, when she was a teenager, um, the older sister of my father in our village in the Peloponnese, uh, when the Nazis came and took the Peloponnese, occupied the Peloponnese, um, the house where my father was born and his family lived had no plumbing, but it did have a second floor. So the Nazis took over the second floor of their home, and she was hidden in a grain bin in the basement until they knew whether or not it was safe for her to come out. Uh, my husband's father and three uncles were all in the underground resistance on the island of Crete. So, <laughs> incredible, incredible bravery. Uh, in fact, last month one of his uncles passed away. He lived his life without his right ear because they could get cut off the war. And um, the our family story was very, very much in integrated in part of the outcomes uh, of the Second World War. Three out of four of Mark I, my parents, came to the United States as displaced people. Um, but I will tell you, it was a different experience, I think, for Greeks than it was, well, a very different experience, that even though um, there were atrocities, Greeks did not experience the kinds of dehumanization uh, that led up to um, the horrors of the show. Uh, nevertheless, very much um, part of our family history intertwines uh, with the stories of Europe um, leading up to the Second World War and after. 
which of course I learned a great deal about when I was in Hungary. Well, thank you for sharing that. Would you tell us a little bit about your time in Hungary and what your experience was like as the U.S. ambassador? So um, we have we had at the time almost 400 U.S. government uh, employees in Budapest. And a big part of what you do as ambassador is you have to, on behalf of the United States, um, have a deep and, and current understanding of the country, the culture, the politics, the people, the issues. Uh, it, it is your job to thoroughly know what is going on. And in fact, our embassies around the world for other embassies are usually the place where everyone goes for kind of accurate information. And, it is not an understatement to say that you cannot understand anything about Hungary if you do not know the story of the Jewish communities of Hungary throughout the centuries in, in that part of the world. Um, probably most relevantly from the time of Franz Joseph when uh, he gave civil rights to the Jews at the end of the 1800s uh, through um, the 1920s, when the numerous clauses laws went into effect at a time when 20% of Budapest was Jewish. Uh, through the, uh, the war years, and then of course 1944, when uh, in a period of about three months, 420,000 Jews were deported to the camps, um, most to their deaths. And um, again, something you might not know that one out of every three Jews killed at Auschwitz-Birkenau was from Hungary. So every building I went into, every personal item, every conversation I had, everything linked back to the golden age of Hungary, which was driven by the, the emancipation and the franchisement of the Jewish communities, to the collapse of society into the depths of the forest of the Holocaust. And the fact that in this relatively small country, every family and every story was impacted in one way or another by that history in a way that has continued to color the, the culture and the, the stories and, and frankly, the current situation of anti-Semitism and democratic backsliding. And, and I will say this, three and a half years of a daily engagement, it can bring you to some pretty dark places just as a human being. And the only thing, the only thing that you can hold on to is that pledge Never forget, never forget. That's it. I think I enjoyed hearing some of that and how it, uh, the, the history of the Jewish people there shaped your perspective as ambassador. Uh, many of our Jewish federations, including ours in San Francisco, have strong global Jewish people good projects. So I've had the chance to visit with the Jewish community of the past time a number of occasions, if it's a really special community there. So thank you. So I was asking this morning, should I call you ambassador? Should I call you lieutenant governor? And you just saw that Governor Gisela is actually out of the country. So today, I get to call you acting governor. <laughs> so I just call me a <laughs> So um, can you please tell us a little bit about what the lieutenant governor does for the state of health care? Well, um, I will say, since you mentioned uh, Governor Newsom, that in the six years that I've been serving in this position, it really has been because of this incredible willingness to partner with my office and, and elevate and help to uh, reestablish kind of the functionality of the office of the Lieutenant Governor that I've been able to do a great job. Um, uh, we ran a bill together to put the Lieutenant Governor on the board of the community college system. So now I'm the only person to sit on all three boards of public higher education in the state. We do see the CSU in the community college system. This was a vision of mine to really focus this office long term on public higher education of the state, which is so important. And I think we're going to talk a little bit about what's been going on on campuses 
Um, but that's a big part of what I do. My dad, as I mentioned, came as a refugee. He started out as a farm worker. He worked as a waiter in the governor's mansion. To put himself through Sacramento State at university, uh, and that is the, not just the story of my come, it's, it's really the story of California, of the two point seven million students in public higher ed in, in the state of California. Conservatively, 38% were the first in their family to go to college. So I spent a lot of time in that space, making it more accessible, more user-friendly, and the system for our students. Um, secondly, uh, I work on major environmental issues as the alternating chair of the State Lands Commission. And I was saying I made a pledge uh, on offshore drilling. There is less offshore drilling today than there was when I was first uh, elected. We have a lot of work to do. Uh, and then um, the governor and I worked together to come up with a partnership by executive order where I'm serving and have now for the last six years as California's representative for international affairs training, um, which is why I spent an enormous amount of time with our consulates. By the way, there are two um, consulates from Israel in California, LA, and in San Francisco. Uh, and as Dave mentioned, an enormous amount of partnership and work that we do on economic issues and combating climate change. Uh, but California uh, is the fifth largest economy in the world. It's a $3.7, $3.8 trillion economy. We are deeply interconnected with the world. And with the governor giving me this portfolio, our office has really been able to help support bringing more foreign direct investment, helping to support more exports, uh, uh, engaging uh, on, on the issue of climate change. So those are kind of the breadth of the things that I do, but as the 50th Lieutenant Governor and the First Woman, uh, it's also a great platform to fight for equity and inclusion in the um, world government. I spent my adult life in New York. We heard last night my people are from, you know, moved to California as adults, came up a lot of first time uh, gene pack couples. So I'm a very so it's helpful to navigate. So thank you. Uh, so you did mention that you serve on these three boards at higher universities. Um, just what's going on nationwide, but particularly in California, is so disturbing on college campuses or game campus. Like, what are you doing? Can you tell us a little bit more about that and how you're making students feel safe and, and protecting um, faculty and the students? Yeah. So first, again, I want to commend your work, Dave, the work of the governor to uh, come up with the elements, the important elements of the Golden State Plan to combat anti-Semitism. Um, what I will say, and we have spent many, many hours um, as regents talking about and working on the challenges on our campuses. Uh, first and foremost, the campuses were woefully unprepared. And even as the um, encampments were building and the issues were building, um, and we had data of students um, not just feeling unsafe, but frankly being unsafe, Jewish students, uh, the, they were not equipped to be able to, to quickly and swiftly move to handle the challenge in front of them. Uh, that's number one. Number two, as they have been attempting to respond, uh, the campuses that the UC have been doing it in a campus by campus manner, whereas you may not know this, the University of California is one university. And so my biggest issue with the way that, that the system has handled this is that it's been, yes. one, they've been unprepared, two, they have not been swiftly getting to the point where they can heat up with the situations, and then third and most importantly, that each campus is handling these situations in their own way with inconsistencies and frankly, sometimes coming up with agreements that they really don't have the authority to come up with, right? So, <laughs> the, 
Bridget to me right now, where said, I'm able, again, because I'm acting right now, I have to be up here, but uh, I'll be joining virtually. Uh, we're in the summer now, uh, largely the, it, it's the de-escalated, um, but we have a lot of work to do. And I think the most important thing that we can be doing from that UC standpoint is, is clarifying where the lines are between freedom to assemble, freedom of speech, and crossing over into the territory of violations of state law or federal law, of course, but also violations of codes of conduct. <laughs> when I worked in Budapest, it often got very dark, and to get, you get used to that, and in sunny California, it's sometimes hard to go there. But I want to read to you, just in case there is anybody in this room that did not see the tweet, three days after October 7th, um, from the, the UC Davis assistant professor. Well, this is it tweets out, he turned. And then again, this is October 10th of 2023. One group of people we have easy access to in the U.S. is all these Zionist journalists who spread propaganda and misinformation. They have houses with addresses, kids in school. They can fear their bosses, but they should fear us more. With an emoji of a dagger, an axe, and three drops of blood. And that squeeze on here today. This is still, you now she was, to the credit of the campus, they can suspend her without pay, took a couple of days. <laughs> but it is still under investigation. Now, if that does not cross a line of code of conduct, my God. What does? What, what is it on Twitter? <laughs> the call to action, and it is a call to action, is identify where the lines are so that everybody on campus knows what you can do and what you cannot do without facing the consequences of, uh, of being suspended or expelled, or uh, in the case of professors, uh, you know, losing your job. So, so that is really important in a brand new work. But um, I feel very confident that uh, in the leadership of the regions, there is the capacity and the intentionality of the leadership to start digging in so that we can be very clear when students come back on campus in the fall, we actually, at the University of California, are prepared. And I, I will tell you this, there is a fellow to you know, you know should, uh, Professor Larry Dynan at Stanford. He is working on a library. He's a good friend of mine. We were at the Giants Dodgers game on opposite sides of that, by the way. But, um, uh, but he is um, sharing, willing to share information at the University of California and how Stanford is going to address these things. So collaboration is very important part of this as well. Thank you for everything you're doing. We did it last night at the um, University of Michigan, like a special group of students just for justice and health. I believe in commission at the school. I think we'll be at the the majority of Jews to get our evidence. Really, you're that it. It's just devastating. And so anything that you can do, I just think it's so important from the highest level for that. Sure, um, let me let me just put my, you know, there's a reason why after you're a US ambassador, you keep the time. And the reason is that there's an expectation that you will, after an experience like that, certain as the senior representative of the United States of America in advancing our foreign policy, that anything you do after you continue to do that. And when I had my very first meeting of the regents, it was the first time that I saw the BDS with my, and all of the alarm bells went off. 
And I called my former colleagues at the Holocaust Museum to start digging in to understand what was going on. What I have been just really trying to reinforce, again, California in so many ways is isolated from a, a real understanding of U.S. foreign policy. But I have really been trying to help people understand that since the birth of Israel 73 years ago, the United States has been the lead champion, the lead champion of Israel, not only recognized it in Washington, but here in California, and that the vast majority of the members of the European, uh, of the United Nations have recognized Israel. That uh, Israel is a, a friend and an ally and, and the most important ally and partner in the region, underpinned by the very values that, that drive our country of, of democracy and freedom and equality and women's rights. And, you know, my, my aunt was a Christian in Jerusalem, never for a moment. Never for a moment felt that she didn't have a right to be there or belong there or be part of the fabric and, and feeling absolutely that 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 Israel was a place that the the Abrahamic religions and the descendants and the, the worshippers were all welcome to to celebrate the the uh, the history. So the fact that there are students who have been swept up in these waves of misinformation that are saying things like from the river to the sea. This is outrageous. And I understand the, the very importance morally and from a national security standpoint of the existence of existence of the celebrations and the the empowerment of Israel in the region. Thank you so much. Uh, we are just we are going to not only protect the Jewish community and our students, but keep keep us safe. The work they're doing on anti-Semitism is just really incredible. I have line of sight to my colleague Roger Fagels and thinks that. Um, as a state hill director, I mean, they're college students here. My daughter's 11 years old. I took her to Berkeley to speak out there during a protest. Everybody is watching. Uh, um, what you're doing is really making a difference, not only for this generation, but the next one. I just want to say thank you for all of your work. And, you know, thank you for that. I do actually want to make one more point, which is that um, we are finding that a large percentage, and in many cases, the majority of the people who are in the encampments have nothing to do with the university's sex toys. All right, so that is not a part of this as well. Uh, and, and again, we, we have work to do. We have this summer to really clarify um, how we are going to go about um, taking control of our campuses back for all of our students who are there for the purpose of going to class and learning and being part of an inclusive community that is safe for all and learning environment that will educate the future leaders of the state of California. Thank That's you. our job.